I am Val Peterson. I know that you have all heard about hydrogen bombs. Perhaps, too, you have heard of something called radioactive fallout, which comes from both atomic and hydrogen weapons. As Federal Civil Defense Administrator, I'd like to talk to you about that. For if this country is ever subjected to an enemy attack, what I'm going to show you now might someday save your life. First, uh, let's take a look at this sketch, the familiar mushroom of the atomic or hydrogen bomb. Notice these particles falling out of the cloud. This is an artist's conception of fallout. Actually, what happens is this. If the bomb explodes close to the ground or into the ground, thousands of tons of pulverized earth and stones and brick and steel particles are sucked up into the cloud, 40 or 50,000 feet or more into the air. These particles become highly radioactive. Much of this material spills out of the mushroom cloud around the point of explosion. The rest is carried along by the winds for some distance before it falls to the earth. This second sketch shows how the cloud has begun to break up and to drift with the winds. Now here is one highly significant point. Radioactive fallout can occur from an absolutely clear sky. You do not have to see the atomic cloud itself over your head to be in a fallout area. This sketch will give you a general idea of the fallout pattern. This being the city, which is the target city, the material will fall out over a considerable area downwind from the target. Now, I'm not here to try and frighten you. As a matter of fact, Americans just don't scare easily anyway. And it's a good thing that they, that they don't in this atomic age. But it is a part of my job as Federal Civil Defense Administrator to give you the facts. Here they are, as far as we know them at this time. All nuclear weapons, atomic and hydrogen bombs alike, produce radioactivity. With the smaller atomic weapons, we did not have to worry too much about fallout. With the larger atomic bombs, and especially with hydrogen weapons, radioactive dust will fall to Earth far beyond the range of fire and blast in the direction of the prevailing winds at the time of the explosion. Now, as you can see, fallout will be a threat not only to so-called target areas, but to many smaller communities far removed from the cities under attack. And in fact, to every farmer living within the area, downwind from the target area and over the distance that the wind may carry these radioactive particles. As a matter of fact, the communities that lie downwind may very well have to withdraw their people from the danger zone laterally, and there will be time because radioactive fallout takes a considerable time uh, to occur. Or the people will have to get into shelters uh, of some type or other, or we may have to do these two things somewhat simultaneously. Now, I won't mince words with you. If you happen to be caught downwind in the path of the fallout and without any shelter, and if you don't get into shelter just as rapidly as you can, these radioactive particles could cause your death, or they may cause you serious injury, depending upon the degree of contamination and other factors. So much for the threat. Now what are we going to do about it? We are still learning things about the behavior of radioactive fallout from the larger weapons. But for the present, we do know enough about the size and power of modern weapons and the radioactive waste they produce to begin planning how we can best protect ourselves. Basically, there are only two things you need to know how to do to protect your life. One is to evacuate your city before the bomb falls. Because obviously, if you are caught in the open near ground zero, you won't have to worry about radiation. The bomb itself will kill you. The other method is to dig deep enough into the ground to escape the effects of blast and heat and radiation. Now come and look at this layout of a typical city. Let's say that right here is the assumed aiming point of enemy bombers, and that the Weather Bureau tells us that the winds will probably carry 
radioactive fallout downwind in this direction. When we speak of the winds, incidentally, and of the H-bomb, we're talking not only of surface winds, but also of the winds high up, 25, 40, and 50,000 feet above the Earth. Those are the winds that carry the major portion of radioactive material from the bomb cloud. Well, up to now, the picture looks pretty bad. But with enough warning and enough practice in peacetime exercises, many millions of lives can be saved that surely would be otherwise lost. Now let's take another case. Suppose you live in a small town, squarely in the path of the radioactive fallout. The further away from that bomb you are, downwind, the more time you will have to get out. Radiological monitors will have set up warning systems. An evacuation from the towns in the probable fallout zone will be carried out on a lateral basis. Suppose now that you get little or no warning, or that your own evacuation route lies downwind. Almost any kind of shelter can reduce the danger of radiation. An ordinary frame house like this, outside the area of blast and fire, will provide some protection. A basement shelter will provide even more, while a simple underground shelter with three feet of earth covering will give you virtually complete protection from lethal radiation. One thing we want to remember about shelter, however, is that once in it, you may not be able to go outdoors for several days except for short periods. Radiation, contrary to some scare story you may have heard, doesn't contaminate the countryside forever. Its lethal strength dies very rapidly sometimes in a few hours, but it might be a couple of days or even longer before it would be safe to leave your shelter altogether. For some time we have urged that every family that possibly can build a basement shelter or an outdoor shelter if they live in the so-called fringe areas of our major cities. Today with the danger of radiation fallout over long distances, it is equally important that residents of suburban and rural areas, many miles removed from major cities, also build shelters. They should stock them with emergency supplies of essentials, such as blankets, first aid kits, food and water, and other articles shown in, in this sketch. A battery-operated radio will enable you to receive civil defense news and instructions over the Conrad emergency radio broadcasting frequencies at 640 and 1240 on your dials. Civil defense, in the final analysis, has always been a local problem. Some areas, for instance, could be evacuated practically around a 360 degree circle. In other areas, such as this one, where a city has an ocean on one side and may be surrounded by rivers, evacuation problems will be far more difficult. Civil defense, like military defense, must be flexible and adaptable, both to new weapons and varying local conditions. I'd like to emphasize this one point in closing. We'll do all we can in the federal government to get information to you on defense against these new weapons as fast as the scientists can give it to us. And believe me, there are defenses. We'll help you all we can, but the responsibility is first of all yours to work out in conjunction with your local civil defense director. Cooperate with him by participating in evacuation and shelter tests, by taking first aid and other civil defense training. Help that civil defense director of yours all you can. He has a big job, a job that could save your life, the lives of your family your neighbors, the life of our nation. Thank you.